Change is coming by disaster or by design. We hold the power to change the political calculus in America. We have power. We have so much power. So we will vote, we will resist, we will hug trees, we will stop our own polluting, we will boycott companies that pollute. <laughs> This really marks the escalation of Fire Drill Fridays. And you know, so much of my Hope also comes from watching how ideas move from the shadows and the edges and the margins uh, towards the center. Our social movements have grown exponentially. Don't blink, don't back down from this fight, because when it comes to us and climate deniers, we will win politically and we will win on the policy. Woo! Yes, we have the power to make changes, right? And we need to build a better world. So I'll see you next time. Thank you. you fire drill firefighters and welcome to our our first Friday of the month rally. I'm wearing my rally hat and it's an important rally. There's a lot going on. Um, for all of you who are joining for the first time, welcome to Fire Drill Friday's family where we learn about the climate crisis and what we can do about it. This Wednesday, the House passed HR1, House Resolution 1, the For the People Act. This is a once in a generation democracy reform package, which will change campaign finance laws to get dark money out of politics, limit partisan gerrymandering and protect our elections and voting rights among many other important things. Passing this landmark legislation through the Senate is a critical step in strengthening democracy, ending fossil fuel subsidies, and beginning a just transition. If you want to know why the United States has such profound economic inequality, why the desperate need to address climate change has been continually set aside and minimized, and why protections for workers have been decimated, why hedge fund billionaires pay a far lower tax than middle class workers, all you have to do is understand the role of dark money. It happened in January 21st, 2010, when the Supreme Court announced its five to four decision in the Citizens United case, overturning a century of restrictions, banning corporations and unions from spending all they wanted to elect a candidate. The court held that so long as businesses and unions didn't just hand their money off to, uh, you know, to a candidate, because that would be corrupt, but instead gave it to outside groups that were technically independent of the campaign, they could spend unlimited amounts to promote whatever candidates they chose. To reach this verdict, dig this, the court accepted the argument that corporations had the same rights to free speech as citizens. Previously, you see, contributions to political action committees or PACs had been capped at $5,000 per person per year. But now the court found that there could be no donation limits as long as there was no coordination with the candidate's campaign. And these groups were called super PACs. In only four years, from 2006 to 2010, following the Supreme Court decision, Dark money spending went from only 2% of political spending to 40%, masking hundreds of millions of dollars. This is what led to the Republican sweep on Congress in the 2014 midterm election during Obama's second term. Remember that? The Koch brothers, Charles and the late David Koch, were at the center of 
the dark money machinations. They and their network of ultra wealthy, ultra conservative libertarians, a great number of whom, like the Kochs, made their fortunes in the fossil fuel industries, spent over $100 million in competitive House and Senate races. And last November, that election saw a record $14 billion spent, double the previous record. So you see how hard it's going to be to cut carbon emissions in half by 2030? Dark money is one of the key things that HR1 aimed to address, and today we're going to hear from heroes of our democracy about how this historic bill addresses the urgent action needed on climate and how that fight is inherently connected to the fight for racial justice and democracy. And to add the power of song and music to today's rally, we'll be joined by and serenaded by special music guests and longtime freedom fighters, Sweet Honey and the Rocks. Now is the time like no other for people to take bold actions. It's time for the Senate to pass S1. You see, S1 is the companion bill to HR1, which just passed the House this last Wednesday. A bill must pass both the House and the Senate before going to the President to be signed into law. S1 holds the same demands for transformative change that are in HR1 that ensures our voices and that ensure that ensure that our voices are the ones that are heard and not corporations. We have to stop the undue influences that corporations have over our politics. It's, it's the anniversary because in 2019 it passed the House, failed the Senate because of Mitch McConnell. And um, because of what happened last November, the Biden-Harris administration, as well as the Georgia runoff, what that means is that we have more leverage uh, in the government for Democrats in the Senate, and hopefully this time it will pass. H.R. 1, the For the People Act, was originally introduced in 2019 and reintroduced this January by Congressman John Sarbanes, who's represented Maryland's third congressional district in the U.S. Congress since 2007. He currently serves on the House Committee on Energy and Commerce, in addition to the House Subcommittee on Health and the House Subcommittee on Environment and Climate Change, among other committees. Since 2017, he's chaired the Democracy Reform Task Force, a bold effort in the House of Representatives to build a government that puts the public's interest ahead of special interests. Please welcome Congressman Sarbanes. Thank you very much, uh, Jane. It's wonderful to be with you and with all the guests and those who are out there listening to this. We have reached a, a unique moment of opportunity for our democracy. There's no question. The stakes could not be higher in terms of HR1, the For the People Act. And as you point out, this is S1 on the Senate side. So we know there's this unified sense of priority across the Capitol. And it meets the appetite and demand and hope and expectation of the broad public out there. I know that to be true because we actually built this bill based on listening to the grievances and concerns of everyday Americans. And here's what they were telling us. The first thing they were saying was, we wanna to get to the ballot box every two years without having to run an obstacle course. It's crazy, here we are 50 years after John Lewis shed blood on the Edmund Pettus Bridge marching for the right to vote. And we're nowhere near a gold standard when we compare ourselves to our peer nations. So HR1 has these wonderful reforms, automatic voter registration, same day registration, mail-in voting, making that more convenient and possible, early voting. And it really penalizes voter suppression, voter intimidation, and these other efforts to block access. So that's the first thing people said to us. And we respond, in HR 1, the For the People Act. The second thing they said was, you got to respect the voter uh, when it comes to drawing congressional district lines in America. Let's have an independent process for that. So the voters pick the politicians and not the other way around. So we've got reforms that would uh, fix how gerrymandering and redistricting happens in America and respect the people of the country. They also said to us, when you get to Washington, 
behave yourselves, act ethically, be accountable, be transparent. So we have a whole set of reforms in there that would promote that kind of ethical accountability, which are really key. But I have to, I have to align myself with, with your perspective. The money is really the most corrosive and corrupting influence that we face in our democracy today. And it's for the very reasons you said. It blocks progress on all of the things people care about. Wall Street uses money through campaign donations and lobbyists to block fair tax policy. The oil and gas industry and the chemical industry use money to block action on climate change and other measures that can improve our environment. In fact, Oil Change International a few years ago teamed up with the Sierra Club. They did a study that showed that the oil and gas industry is earning a 5,800% return on the investment they make in lobbyists and campaign donations because they get billions of dollars in taxpayer subsidies every year. But it's blocking progress on gun safety measures. The money gets in there and corrupts the system. And the list goes on and on and on. So what this bill would do is it would demand transparency and disclosure. So we know where that secret money is coming from. It can't hide in the shadows anymore, which would actually deter a lot of the activity that we've seen since that terrible Citizens United case. It would fix the broken Federal Election Commission. And for the listeners here today, the reason that's important is that's the agency that's like the cop on the beat that can blow the whistle when the big money actors get out of hand. So we need them during campaigns to make sure that the big money isn't leaning on our democracy. But here's my favorite. We set up a small donor matching system that we're, would reward candidates who reach out and collect small donations, allow them to earn matching funds and power their campaigns that way, which means what? They don't have to go hat in hand to the lobbyists. They don't have to go to the PACs and the super PACs and the insider political donor class to bankroll their campaigns. They can go to everyday Americans, collect small donations and get matching funds. And here's the, the, the best part of it. You know who's gonna pay for that system? Not the taxpayer. We put a small surcharge on government settlements with these big corporate lawbreakers and high-end tax cheats and we use those dollars in something called the Freedom from Influence Fund to match those small donations. And that's important because that means that the people who have been breaking the trust of the country are gonna to have to pay for a system that can restore it. So we're excited about this. I appreciate very much the interest. We feel organically there's an uptake about what HR1 can do, the difference it can make in our democracy. And this isn't for any political party or candidate. It's for Democrats, independents, and Republicans alike who are showing that they want to see this bill get passed. We can do this, but it's going to be an epic battle because the other side and those who want to preserve the status quo are leaning hard against it. But if the people of the country weigh in, we can get this over the finish line and we can restore, finally, a government of, by, and for the people. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Congressman Sarbanes, for helping us understand the importance of HR1, which now that it's in the Senate is S1. And we will do all we can to persuade the senators to pass it. Thank you so much. And my next guest, our next guest, is Jocelyn Benson, Michigan's 43rd. Secretary of State. In this role, she's focused on ensuring elections are secure and accessible. Benson is the author of State Secretaries of State, Guardians of the Democratic Process. It's the first major book on the role of the Secretary of State in enforcing election and campaign finance laws. She's a graduate of Harvard Law School, an expert on civil rights law, education law, and election law. Benson served as Dean of Wayne State University Law School in Detroit. When appointed at 36, she became the youngest woman in U.S. history to lead a top 100 accredited law school. In 2015, 
She became one of the youngest women in history to be inducted into the Michigan Women's Hall of Fame. Please welcome Secretary of State Jocelyn Benson. Thank you, Jane, and uh, thank you all for having me here today. I just want to speak very briefly about what and what this means, what this legislation means for all of us, particularly as we come off of what was a really extraordinarily successful election, a hard fought win, but a win nonetheless for democracy. Uh, and I really also want to start by thanking you, Jane, for bringing us here today and building these connections. You came out to Michigan in 2018 to tell voters how important it was to make sure that voting was protected because it is the protector of everything else from climate change to every other issue, healthcare, access to quality education. It all starts with whether you have access to the ballot box. And what we saw in 2020, even in the midst of a global pandemic, was that citizens had access to the ballot box and they used it. They voted in higher numbers than ever before in every state in this country. That's why it was a success and that's why there was such an effort in many ways to block those citizens' voices and votes, even in Michigan, uh, as people showed up outside my home uh, to demand an overturning of the, of the election that culminated, of course, in January 6th as those who would seek to deny democracy showed up in, uh, in the halls of Congress. And, and so as we saw firsthand that victory, that win was hard fought and the fight to protect the vote has only escalated and manifested itself in different ways in the weeks since January 6th. And it has manifested itself in the halls of the state legislatures in Georgia, in Florida, in Iowa, and other states all around the country. In fact, 43 states have proposed two, over 250 pieces of legislation to try to roll back the very protections and avenues to voting that citizens took advantage of in record numbers in 2020. In other words, after trying to protest the vote following the election, now after we, those of us guarding democracy, stopped that from happening. The effort is now turned from taking all of that worked to amplify people's voices and ensure millions of people could vote and have their vo voices heard in 2020 to changing the rules so that they can't vote again or have a much harder time doing so in the next election in 22 and in 24 and every election to follow. And so as we see this happening on the states, in Georgia in particular, in, in recent days, in recent weeks, the question becomes, what can we do? What can we all do other than have folks in office uh, to protect against that rollback? Well, this federal legislation is that answer. The reauthorization of the Voting Rights Act, which is in, in HR 4, the John, the, voting, the John Lewis Voting Rights Act, and HR 1, which has just passed the House and now is heading to the Senate, this is the answer. This is the protection for democracy that every voter in this country needs to stop state legislators that are blatantly trying to uh, reenact Jim Crow era legislation uh, in many ways to eliminate and roll back protections that have been hard fought for every citizen and that were used by citizens in 2020 to vote in record numbers. So we can't let that happen. We have to continue this battle to protect democracy in this new front, which is in the state legislatures and by making sure the federal government is playing the role it has always played in protecting the right to vote by stepping in and protecting voters in states throughout the country, like a Georgia, like Florida, from the efforts of those politicians in those states that are trying to roll back protections on their voice. We need the federal government to step in and say, just as it did in 1965 in the passage of the Voting Rights Act, just as it did with the passage of the Help America Vote Act after the 2000 election, we need the federal government to step in and protect the people's voices in every state in this country. Uh, and the other aspect, the other reason why, that it, well, I'll say two last things. One, the reason why this bill is so important is not just because it protects everyone's access to the vote, but as Representative Sarbane said, it also protects the, it also 
eradicates a lot of the measures that have been put in place to uh, limit and minimize people's voices in Washington. And one of those also is gerrymandering, this art of drawing districts to lead to a certain outcome so that no matter how many people vote in a particular congressional district, the outcome has been predetermined by the way the district has been drawn. Here in Michigan, we have citizens drawing those districts to make sure that it's the districts are drawn with an eye towards what's best for voters. But in the majority of states in this country, politicians draw their own districts or the districts of their friends to basically enable the reelection of themselves, their friends, or their own party representatives, and thereby rig the outcome of an election before anyone's even shown up to vote. So this bill also does away with that by putting citizens in charge of districting all across the country. And that's a process that has worked in Michigan and in California and in other states where citizen-led independent districting can actually eradicate and eliminate gerrymandering once and for all. So I can't tell you that how important this legislation is. It's the most uh, comprehensive voting rights reform in a generation. And we have an opportunity to push back against all these efforts that are trying to minimize people's voices, not just now, but have been built up over decades and actually pass federal legislation uh, to amplify and protect people's voices and thereby enable all of us to fight for everything else from access to quality education, to climate change and protections and everything in between. So uh, we need your voices. We need your voices now. And over this next month, as this battle is fought in Washington, DC and all across the country to ensure that we have those protections in place for every citizen. And so again, thank you, Jane, for using your platform to amplify this important piece of legislation and the work being done all across the country to protect people's voices. And we'll be right there with all of you to make sure we continue to fight to protect our democracy just as we did successfully in 2020 and as we will do continually for years to come. Yeah. Thank you, Secretary Benson, for helping us understand how important this legislation is to saving our democracy. Thank you. And now for some wonderful music. Sweet Honey in the Rock is the internationally renowned Grammy awarded nominated female a cappella vocal quartet with over four decades of commitment to empowerment education and entertainment. They've created positive, loving, and socially conscious message music that matters as it pertains to spiritual fortification. And they've consistently taken an activist stance toward making this planet a better place for all. Welcome back to Fire Drill Friday's Sweet Honey and the Rocks. Yeah. 
Thank you. Thank you to the always wonderful Sweet Honey in the Rocks. And our next speaker is Laura Williamson, a senior policy analyst at Demos, a think tank powering the movement for a just, inclusive, multiracial, multiracial democracy. At Demos, Laura works to advance voting rights and to build the power of small donors. And she's worked on many of the policies included in the For the People Act for years. She also works closely with the Black and Latinx leaders who make up Demos's Inclusive Democracy Project to win state and local policies that expand access to democracy and to envision bold new ideas to end racist exclusions and remake our democracy. She lives in Washington, D.C., the nation's soon-to-be 51st state, if SI passes. Welcome, Laura Williamson. Thank you, Jane. It's such a treat to be here with you and this powerful group of leaders talking about two of the most pressing issues of our lives, climate change and democracy. And just like the climate crisis poses an existential threat to our survival as a people, the struggle for our democracy presents existential questions about who we are and what we wanna be as a nation. And this struggle is fundamentally a battle between forces intent on upholding racism and white supremacy and us, we the people who are fighting for an inclusive multiracial democracy, the kind of democracy we know is absolutely critical if we're gonna win on everything we care about, whether it's climate justice or an equitable economy or healthcare for all. Now, let's be clear, this battle is not new. In fact, it's as old as our country. Why? Because American democracy was designed to enshrine the power of wealthy white men at the expense of everyone else. And in particular, it was designed to keep black and brown people from building governing power in our political system. This was true at our founding with the ratification of a pro-slavery constitution. It's been true throughout history with the white backlash to radical reconstruction and of course, Jim Crow. And it's true to this day when a white supremacist mob egged on by a white supremacist president, former president, <laughs> um, would rather tear down our capital than see a black South Asian woman in the White House on the very day after Georgians sent their first black senator to Washington. Now, let's be real. Black and brown folks have been building power anyway all along despite these exclusions. And black Americans in particular have been leading a struggle to make our democracy work better for everyone from the Reconstruction Amendments that opened up our democracy after the Civil War, to the landmark legislation of the Civil Rights Movement that ended Jim Crow, to today, when Black and Brown voters again showed up in mass, this time in the midst of a deadly pandemic and facing down egregious voter suppression to demand a change, and ultimately to usher in this governing moment that Jane talked about. We must make this moment the beginning of the next chapter in our centuries long project of building a multiracial inclusive democracy. And the first step in that chapter is the For the People Act. The For the People Act is a transformative racial justice package that takes bold policies that are already working all across the country uh, to remake our democracy, uh, to uproot the white supremacy and to advance racial justice. It does this in many ways, but let's talk about just three of them. Number one, Voter registration. Now, registration is not some inherent trait in a democracy. In fact, it doesn't even exist in many other democracies. It was invented in the United States to keep black people and working people and immigrants from voting. And it's working as designed. There are stark racial disparities in registration rates to this day. The For the People Act addresses this by advancing online voter registration, automatic voter registration, and same day registration, which together would ensure that registration is never again a barrier to the ballot box. Number two, racist felony disenfranchisement laws. These laws were explicitly designed to keep black people from voting to the extent that the lawmakers who wrote them actually distinguished between crimes that they thought were more likely to be committed by black people and crimes they thought were more likely to be committed by white people and only took away the right to vote for these. And just like registration, they're working as intended and keep millions of black and brown folks from voting each election. The For the People Act addresses this too. It would restore the voting rights of people once they are uh, leave prison. 
So it would actually automatically re-enfranchise 1.7 million Black and Latinx Americans when it passes. And then number three, big money in our politics. Our elections today are fueled by a tiny, wealthy, white, mostly male donor class. And we know those folks share different policy priorities than the rest of us. And the For the People Act addresses this through the programs that Congressman Sarbanes mentioned, small donor public financing programs that are already working across the country to build the power of small donors, to make it easier for people of color and women and working class candidates to run for office and to win, and ultimately to make our elections and our elected officials more accountable to us. The list of the ways that the For the People Act advances racial equity goes on and on. It is literally hundreds and hundreds of pages of policy solutions aimed at fulfilling the promise of our democracy for the very first time. But, and this is a big but, to be able to do that, it has to pass. And that's where you and I come in. If we wanna choose this vision of a multiracial inclusive democracy, we have to fight like hell for it. We know that our opponents will, they always have but we also know that we are stronger. We are a multiracial, intersectional, intergenerational, multi-faith coalition, and we can win this thing. But our members of Congress have to hear from us. They have to know that it is a top priority that we are watching and that we expect them to deliver on their campaign promises. So call your representatives, thank them for passing the For the People Act this week, call your senators, tell them to take it up immediately and pass it, and while you're at it, remind them that the For the People Act is actually just the first step in this new chapter. Once we win that, they have to take up and pass the John Lewis Voting Rights Advancement Act. They have to pass the Native American Voting Rights Act. They have to pass statehood for the fine folks of Washington, DC. Whew, this is a lot. It may feel overwhelming. I often feel overwhelmed, but I just wanna leave y'all with a reminder that we have moved mountains before. Black and brown Americans have charted a course for a multiracial inclusive democracy, a different kind of democracy than we have currently, all along. I take inspiration from that resistance, that vision, and ultimately those victories. And I urge you to, to take that inspiration, to hold it tightly, and let's move this thing across the finish line. Thank you, Jane. Thank you. Thank you so much, Laura, for helping us understand how critical this legislation is. And our next speaker is Rhea Thompson Washington. She is a senior democracy manager at the Center for Popular Democracy Action Network's Voting Rights and Democracy Program. In the 2020 election cycle, Rhea created, implemented, and managed CPDA's 2020 Voting and Electoral Strategy, the Voter Guardian and Engagement Program. Rhea is an active member of the Lawyers Guild DC Mass Defense Chapter. She regularly trains legal observers to watch the actions of police at protests and provides coaching for First Amendment demonstrators and protesters to know their rights in the streets. Please welcome Rhea. Greetings and salutations all. Um, thank you so much, Jane. It's great to talk to to you all, as, as was stated by Laura and um, Secretary Benson and um, Representative Sarbanes, HR1, which is now SR1 for us, is not only important to advance for all of the reasons that they mentioned, but we also need to think about the ways in which white supremacy has led us to the point that we have to make sure that people have access to the ballot, um, the voting ballot at the at voting box at the ballot. And here's the reason why. Um, and including in addition to um, you know, same day registration, automatic voter registration, online voter registration. Um, HR1, SR1 would eliminate banning use it or lose it voter privileges and, and the purges. And the reason we want that to happen is because when we know that people who intend to vote, um, when they get to the voting, the, the voting booth and they find out that they have been removed from the polls, that itself is another um, way to limit people from being able to participate in the process. And that happens because we the powers that be have currently decided that they only wanna be able to choose who can be um, represented, who, can, who they want to represent and not all of the people that actually need representation. We know that um, right now states are able to enact 
um, really discriminatory voter ID laws, and SR1 is, will address that. It would eliminate discriminatory voter ID laws, especially in states like as was mentioned earlier, there's over 250 um, new laws trying to make sure that people are disenfranchised around the states. I myself spent three months in Georgia from the general election to the Senate runoff, making sure that people had access to the ballot, registering voters to, um, to vote, and then even on election day, um, dealing with the people who were not able to register to vote, who wanted to be able to cast a ballot and try to figure out that process. So we know that same day voter registration is not only important, but it is a way that makes sure that everybody gets involved in this process at a different point through their own measures. And so oftentimes um, the reason that somebody didn't vote is because they weren't asked to vote. They weren't talked about to register. They didn't they didn't know the things, the information that they needed. And so um, this bill makes it just a little bit easier so that folks don't have to worry about whether or not they're registered to vote. If they decide to go vote, they can vote. If they decide not to vote because they don't want to in that cycle, they're not purged or eliminated from being able to participate in the process. And we know that these um, types of discriminatory processes adversely affect significantly black and brown communities. We saw what happened in Georgia that literally because of early voting being available on the weekends, because of people going out and registering folks all across the state in the middle of a pandemic, and then going back to make sure that they were able to vote. We know that that had an impact because we were able to turn out not just one, but two senators from the state of Georgia and turn Georgia blue. And as a result, now we have an opportunity to push these senators to back us up in Congress, so to take up what we need to make sure to happen. Um, the other thing is, is that in 2020, we saw a lot of folks use the option to vote by mail. We wanna make sure that folks are um, not like discriminated from voting by mail because of having to create reasons to be able to have a mail-in ballot. That the, the real is, is that no matter what your reason is, you should be able to vote however it is most convenient for you by mail, online, going to stand in line, whatever is necessary, because that is the way that you participate in the process. And so as Laura just talked about, we need to use the words and acknowledge that um, a lot of these um, bills and prohibitions come down to white supremacist tactics of keeping people out of the process. And instead of trying to allow for more people to participate so that we can actually have this inclusive, more perfect union that we talk about that's written about in our constitution, we have to allow people to participate and choose their leadership. And so um, I wanna make sure before I go that we just also consider that um, another way that folks are discriminated against at the ballot is being given provisional ballots that often aren't counted later. Um, provisional ballots should be recorded and counted every single time that they um, are cast, and it's because that person made the intention to vote. They made the effort to vote, and when we when provisional ballots are not counted or not included in the final um, countings, that means that there are people who made their intention, and for whatever reason generally based on the person who was leading the poll the poll worker um, decides that that person isn't registered or isn't able to cast a ballot. So we wanna have more ways that we can um, hold Congress accountable, make sure that the federal government um, make, provides that states cannot limit people's access to ballot. And then lastly, Washington DC has more than half a million people living it. Um, there are mo so many people here who do not have representation. We have known for years that the reason that re that Republicans try to keep um, Washington, D.C. from becoming a state is because it will be 70 percent Black state. And we don't have that other than maybe in the South, in some places, in Mississippi even. And so it's important that we give the people who are paying taxes in the district um, as much federal taxes as um, states like Wyoming, where there's more people in DC than even in Wyoming. We need to make sure that they have representation in Congress, that they can participate in the process and that their votes matter and that they're able to cast those ballots. Thank you very much. Happy Friday. <laughs> Thank you so much, Maria. Thank you so much for all the hard work that you did in Georgia to help make that outcome 
So good. Thanks a lot. Our next speaker is Rashad Robinson, who's the president of Color of Change, a leading racial justice organization driven by more than 7.2 million members who are building power for black communities. Color of Change uses innovative strategies to bring about systemic change in the industries that affect black people's lives from Silicon Valley, Wall Street, and Hollywood, to City Hall, state legislatures, and Washington, D.C. Under Rashad's leadership, Color of Change designs and implements winning strategies across the boards for racial justice. Rashad is widely consulted for strategies for corporate accountability, transforming the criminal justice system, media and tech reform, cultural change, and building black political power. Color of Change has been named three times in Fast Company's Most Innovative Companies list and was profiled by the Stanford Social Innovation Review. Please welcome Rashad Robinson. Thank you so much, Jane. It's a great to be with you and all the other speakers and all of the folks at the rally. It's such um, an honor to be here and to follow the other speakers. Jane, the last time I saw you was um, before the pandemic and you were um, hosting an event at your home uh, for white folks who were um, standing up for racial justice. This was before the pandemic, before the uprisings. And of course, um, just um, one more of the many things you have done over the years to stand up for justice and to invite more people into the conversation. So thank you. It is an honor to be on this program with you. The thing I want to sort of leave us with, because the other speakers did such an incredible job of talking about all the various pieces of, of, of this legislation, of HR1, of, of Senate 1, and the path um, that um, it will provide for more participation. I want to talk about a different path, the path to get there. So this summer, for all of us who were paying attention, um, when many of us thought that the best we could do in terms of activism was clap outside of our windows or uplift investigative journalism, it was racial justice that got people into the streets. It was racial justice that translated people's energy to stand up and speak out and actually led to that spike in voter registration. Racial justice is the most powerful motivating force that we have. Racial justice has the potential to drive people into the streets, drive people into, the, into action. And since this summer, racial justice has become a majoritarian issue. I'm not saying that people of color are the majority. I'm saying that racial justice, because of a multiracial coalition of people that are standing up and speaking out, that racial justice is a majoritarian issue. And part of what we have to do is the work to translate a majoritarian issue into a governing majority, to translate the presence and visibility of so many racial justice issues into the power to actually change the rules. And it starts with our ability to express our will for a better future through the ballot box. Expressing our will for a better future, regardless of whether we are privileged or vulnerable, in the majority or the minority or in favor or out of favor with whoever may be in power. We cannot win if we cannot vote. And our opponents know that they can't win if we can. And so this is what we are up against. We are up against a piece of legislation that has passed in the House, has support of the White House, but will be stalled in the Senate because of Jim Crow era laws and Jim Crow era rules like the filibuster, which will prevent progress and have far too often prevented progress. So you don't have to take my um, words on the filibuster being sort of a Jim Crow era policy. We can just take the words of those that have used it. So in 1935, uh, Georgia Democrat Richard Russell organized a six-day filibuster to oppose um, anti-lynching laws. He had, um, you know, wanted to actually look at it as preserved. And he said um, that he was willing, these are his words, he was willing to go as far and make as great a sacrifice to preserve and ensure white supremacy in the social economic and political life of our state as any man who lives within her borders. 
Now the Senate's grandest office building, the Russell Building, is named after him. And there has never been anti-lynching law that has passed the United States Senate. Senator Strong Thurmond set the record for the longest one man filibuster in history. Um, and that was to block the passage of the 1957 Civil Rights Act, which protected voting rights for black Americans. And in so many ways that 24 hour screed transformed the way that they actually do the filibuster. So once upon a time, people would have to go down to the well and stand there for days or hours and, and, and talk and talk and talk. Now, since 1970, most filibusters have been silent. And that is what the right wing will do this time around if we don't stop them. They will try to block this piece of legislation in silence in the dark. That is why it is so important that we recognize the power that we have as a racial justice movement with the power that racial justice has, not only to win us um, real change on criminal justice, but to win us real change on climate, to win us real change on progress around the economy, to win us real change on so many of the uh, issues that we care about. It will not Racial justice is not the thing that we win when we get a true democracy. Racial justice is the driver that helps us achieve a true democracy. So the work ahead is getting more and more of us in action, in motion, to fight, to make sure that as they put barriers in our way, we work to remove them, that we recognize that we are not going to succumb to the tactics of Jim Crow era rules that will stand in the way of our fight for a better tomorrow. We will always always lose in the back rooms of Congress if we do not have millions of people lined up at the front door. And that is where we all come into action. So the work ahead is to not only push those on the right who may be standing in the way, but those who say they are our friends, but are not willing to remove the barriers that will unlock the potential for this legislation to truly pass. That is the road ahead. That is how we translate presence into power. And that is how we make this moment, this moment of possibility where we can translate a majoritarian issue, which is racial justice, into a governing majority, unlocking the potential for all of us to achieve more, to have more, and to experience a society that is on all of our sides. Thank you so much for having me. And back to you, Jen. Oh, thank, you. Oh, thank, you. Yes. thank you so much, Rashad, for all the work you do and for your great energy. And thanks to all of you again, uh, all of the speakers, all to Sweet Honey and The Rock for their gift of song. And oh, it gives me so much hope knowing that we can accomplish so much if we do it together. We have to work together. Getting dark money out of politics is an absolute must in order to address the most pressing and important issues of our time. And um, just one second here, we, you know, we, you know, as Rashad said, this is, this is um, the moment. This is the moment that we cannot allow to pass without pushing and advancing justice. We have a real chance as we talked about today there's a lot of money and power trying to maintain the status quo and keep the voices of the people silent. And we just can't allow it to continue. We can end the iron grip of special interests on our democracy and invest in a future where all of us can thrive. As evidence this week, HR1 passed its first test, the House floor vote. Now, as you've heard, the bill is on its way to the Senate the first hearing for S1 is already scheduled for March 25th with the Senate Rules Committee. That'll be the bill's next test to see if the Senate will listen to the people. We have to be sure to pay attention during these next couple of weeks. We need everyone to make sure their Senator knows that it's time to act. This is so much depends on getting this legislation passed. Each of you can be a part of this. Go to firedrillfridays.com slash take action. Please tell your Senator to do their job and move HR1, well now it's S1, uh, forward. People are ready 
for transformative change and passage of S1 will make that change a reality. Tell your senator to prioritize democracy reform by passing S1 for the People Act. If you go to firedrillfriday.com slash take action, you will get all the information you need, all the directions you need to do what's needed. And please, please, we've got to get this legislation through. Thanks to all of you for showing up today and for being part of the Fire Drill Friday family. And thanks to our wonderful audience. We've got a lot of great stuff lined up for March, as well as our first movie night, Thursday, March 25th. Be sure to stay in touch and tune in. Have a safe and inspiring weekend. See you next time.